Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lila Jones, and I am so excited today that I have an opportunity to interview and learn more about an amazing woman. Morgan Harper Nichols is with us today, and it's so awesome to have such a creative soul with us. Uh, when you listen to her audiobooks or you listen to her music, she has a voice like velvet that is just amazing. So excited to have her here today and welcome Morgan. Oh, thank you so much for that introduction. <laughs> wow, it's so on I'm so honored to be here. That really does mean a lot to hear. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So you're an artist. You are an Instagram phenomenon. I mean, you've got all these different projects that you're doing. You have uh, an amazing following and you're just known to be a super authentic soul. And it's just so awesome to be able to really appreciate your work through some of your novels and some of your projects. And today we really just want to learn a little bit more about you. I know you've got some things coming out that we're going to talk about, namely your, your new book. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so I have been writing on this theme, and it's the title of my book of Peace is a Practice. And it's something that I've just been exploring and going deeper into as someone who, like many people, oftentimes feel like there's a lot of overstimulation or just a lot of things going on in our lives. And it can be hard to kind of find different ways to take deep breaths on a regular basis and find ways to encounter peace. So that's something I've, I've been exploring. And, and this book is just kind of an invitation for other people to join me on that journey of, of finding these different practices and rhythms in our life. So yeah. Fantastic. Well, a very early happy birthday. Your birthday is coming you. up what, just a couple of days here. And yes. I know we were saying that uh, you you share that birthday with Rosa Parks, which is pretty phenomenal. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. I, as a young kid, uh, my my mom was an educator, and she taught me at a young age. She's like, "Hey, you share a birthday with Rosa Parks, Rosa Parks." And especially as a young kid, that just stuck with me, and I felt like that even kind of catapulted me into this own my own journey of like just sort of learning history, but through a way that allows room for personal connection. You know, I think a lot of times when we think about history, it's like, okay, there's a textbook history, but there's also just something so special about like finding someone who was either from the same town as you or has the same birthday of like letting that kind of be a guide into like this, these deeper studies about, about history. And I'm just so grateful I had that, you know, as a little kid, you know, my mom telling me that like pre-internet days, because I don't know how, I don't even know how she found out now that I think about it. <laughs> I'm assuming maybe it was in the encyclopedia, like born this day, but yeah, she just told me and I just ran with it. So yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I know that in uh, chapter seven of your book, you talk about connection and I, I feel like it's very adjacent to what we're talking about and that idea of, you know, really being able to take a moment and put together your own personal bibliography. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So over the past, you know, few years, just I, I became a parent, kind of right before um, the initial quarantine started. And and one thing that that, that part taught me, that that part of my life taught me, but it, it affects other areas, is just this idea of of loneliness and isolation that comes, you know, even if you have people that you're able to video chat with or text or whatever, it's, it, it can sometimes feel like, man, I feel kind of alone. Like I feel like I'm not as connected to other people in a way that I maybe want to be or feel like I should be. So I started exploring this idea of somebody who loves books and loves to read and loves to just like remember beautiful moments from my life. I came up with this idea of creating a personal bibliography. So it came, it started from, I opened, I was reading a nonfiction book and in the back of a nonfiction book, you have, you know, all the resources and everything that that person referenced in the book. And I was like, hey, this, this is kind of like a community of writers. Like I've seen these authors like reference each other and I was like, wow, isn't that fascinating? I'm like, so often I think about community as being like 
the people that I'm physically hanging out with. But I was like, community is actually so much more expansive than that. And I was like, all the people that have meant something in my life, whether whether it's from a song lyric or a friend from college, these are all people that I want to hold this as a part of my community, kind of like my own personal bibliography. So I have this journal on it and I talk about it because I, I hope to encourage other people to try to make something like that themselves where they can just keep a collection and in those times where you may start to feel kind of disconnected or not as connected as you want to be, you can return to that practice of filling out this bibliography. It's like, wow, I'm a part of the community. I'm a part of something bigger. And that's something that you can control, right? You can control that experience. And so it's yeah. nice to be able to have that when you need it. But you know, I jumped ahead because I was so excited about the book and your birthday. I do want to maybe take a click back and talk about your background. I know that yeah. uh, you were raised and, and came up with amazing family, but you had undiagnosed autism and had to kind of deal with that your entire life and you continued to press forward. It would be great to know more uh, you know, about that. Yes, yes. Thank you for asking. Yes. So I was diagnosed um, with autism a year ago, uh, about, a, about a year ago. And that was a, a lifelong journey of me. Let, that came from a lifelong journey of me asking questions about the, the way I am in the world that I just didn't have answers for. So one example of that would be um, with autism, there are a lot of social and communication differences. So I don't necessarily um, always pick up on tone very well. So um, I, I have, I mean, I have like a whole library of life stories of me missing out on jokes or sarcasm or not understanding the seriousness just because I'm not hearing tone. And um, that's just one example. And I, and I just, I took that as something's wrong with me. Like, what am I missing? Like, why can't I figure this out? Maybe as I get older, you know, I'll, I'll understand it better. But what I started to realize, like, as I got into adulthood and as I started getting into my late 20s, a lot of that stuff was still persisting. I still felt like in social situations in particular, I was having to do so much mental work just to make sure I'm understanding context and subtext and, and all these different things. And I was like, I think there's something here. So yeah, it was a huge, a huge, um, you know, I say shadow in my life, not that all shadows are, you know, even bad, but it was like just this huge shadow that I just couldn't define and I couldn't understand. And, um, and it was interesting because while I had parents who were very supportive and, and I'm grateful for that outside the house, I mean, I was bullied. My sister and I both, she also has a neurological what? condition. And, and yeah, I mean, I had kids making fun of me. Um, I struggled at times with stuttering. And, and so it was, it was this constant inner turmoil of like, at home, I did feel accepted and free to be myself. But it's like, you're also worthy of being able to leave home and feel accepted as well. And that's just something that I often did not have. Um, and it ended up leading me to finally, when I was 27, I was like, you know what, I think there's something here. I think I could be on the autism spectrum. And I asked my doctor and he just, without even looking at me, like he was just looking at his clipboard and said, there's nothing wrong with you. Like you're perfectly normal. And sadly I took his word and it took until three years later during the pandemic, I was on TikTok of all places. And I encountered stories of, of women who had been diagnosed as adults for whatever reason, but those, those videos just showed up on my feed. And I was like, oh, wait a second, hold on. Um, that's my whole life, what on earth? And that's actually what led me to Googling and finding a specialist in my area. And and it has, like, I'm not, I don't mean to sound dramatic and say that, but I mean, it has changed my life. Like having that information, having that, that knowledge, having that language has brought me a great deal of peace and, and understanding about who I am. Wow, what an amazing story. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of trust, but verify, right? 
Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's great to find that, you know, you finally got to truth on that. You know, your words, I know that in your book that we'll be talking about here in a little bit, that's going to be uh, coming out on February 15th. In your book, in the way that you discuss peace and the way that you, the calmness just washes over your voice, it's almost like a similar sensation to a decadent chocolate that's slowly melting mm -hmm. on your tongue. It just is so incredibly rooted in truth and realness. Uh, I can really, really appreciate it. And hearing your story mm -hmm. connected to that just makes it make all the more sense. But let's let's talk to the audience a little bit, kind of about what fueled some of the intention around peace and and how that's resonated with your audience in this time. Yes. Yeah, so I am a, a huge you know, advocate for people telling their stories. And I know that may sound like cliche, like, OK, everyone says that. But it's a lot easier said than done. <laughs> um, I find it very challenging to tell my story because it's like it's like to tell your story. You're not like it's not like you're you're not a director or a screenwriter writing the story. You're the character in the story. And it's like how do you tell the story as the character? If you watch a movie, they're not telling the story. They're just living the story. So I do think that I'm like, this is kind of hard um, to figure out how to tell your story. So what I, what I feel like I, I try to do with the poetry and art that I share is I try to equip people, myself included, with little things that can help you better understand your story and find language for your story and when you feel safe and comfortable to share your story. And that is why, for instance, I paint a lot of abstract art. And I love to paint abstract art because it's open to interpretation. It's not like, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a picture of a person on a mountain. Nothing wrong with that. That could be absolutely beautiful. But there's something about, and this happens all the time, like I've had moments where I will literally just post like a monochromatic, like mostly blue painting, and it won't even have any words on it. And I'll get messages from people ranging like, like a wild range of human experiences of how that made them feel. It's like, oh, this reminded me of, of a day I spent on the lake with my, my grandparent who passed away. Or this blue reminds me of, of my favorite song that talks about blues. And I just get chills just even thinking about it because I'm just like, wow, I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves, myself included, to like have this like, okay, who am I, you know, and, and how do I tell my story? How do I present myself in the world? How do I present myself at work? How do I brand myself? Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, we're all just humans trying to figure it out in real time. <laughs> so for me, I'm just like, if, if, I, if nothing else, if, if my poetry and my art can, can and my writings can help other people see that we're all in this journey together and we're all learning together in real time. That's what I hope to equip people with. So um, yeah, that's something I, I just try to spend a lot of time with. I haven't figured it out, hence why I'm still practicing and sharing it with people, but it, it just, um, it really excites me when I get those messages and people are able to see themselves, you know, in what I share. And that message of peace, obviously the last couple of years have been challenging for everyone on some level. I'm curious mm -hmm. to know what informed doing it now, why now for this message or what's unique about where we're living in the time we're living in that uh, encouraged yeah. you or inspired you? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, as as most of us, if not all of us, you know, if, if we have if we have the privilege of having access to a technological device, a lot of us have spent more time than ever on our on our devices, on our phones, taking in information. I mean, having to just to figure out how to be safe in the world, having to study like what's going on, you know, what's travel going to look like, all of these things. We're always taking and taking in information. And one thing that I recognized during this time and why I wanted to write this book is that, you know what, there's a lot we're taking in. However, it gets to a point where sometimes intellectually, even if you're taking in good information, even if you're taking in stuff that you want to consume, that is very easy to get disconnected with the body. And it's very easy to get disconnected with our senses. So at the beginning of the book, I very intentionally I define peace as a river. And I talk about peace as a river because I'm like, I know that's not a 
you know, Merriam-Webster Oxford language's definition. But what it does is it helps bring us into the body and thinking of peace as something that's embodied, something that we can access through breathing. And it's like, we may not be able to always just, here's what peace looks like on, you know, this day on the calendar, X, Y, and Z, let's do this, this, and that. And then we'll all experience peace all together. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> it's something we have to practice. We have to practice in our body. So that was actually kind of like the, 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 the thing that started the whole book. And I was just like, I'm just going to run with it. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I know the technical way to define things is with words in a dictionary. And hey, I love etymology. I respect it. I love it. And at the same time, it's like there's an embodied experience that sometimes gets lost in the chaos and the busyness of our world. So I wanted to start with this image of the river. And I also talk about the ocean and kind of the what was what's been a struggle for me there and why the, the image of the river was peaceful in hopes to help other people go on this journey of recognizing, oh, peace is something that I can practice in a very practical everyday way of even just by looking at nature. Wow, I am captivated by that. I'm thinking about your, your comments on breath and I often catch myself doing this. Uh, perhaps you're on a call or something's going on. Perhaps there's some tension in the day. And I'm, I don't know if anybody else can relate to this, but we hold our breath. We hold our breath and we stop breathing. Yes. <laughs> and I don't know why I do that, but it's like, yeah. you hold your breath and you're like, no wonder we're stressed at the end of the day. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. I was holding my breath until you said it. And I was like, oh yeah, I just, I just did it again. <laughs> Oh, so I, I love that you have this, this point of view that is all around. That's something, again, we can control. Just breathe in and breathe out. And being mindful of that is super important. So it's Black History Month. And I know that uh, this is a month that we celebrate African-American people like yourself and all the things they've accomplished. And I have to say that when I was looking in the book and I was reading about your perspective of the Atlantic Ocean and, and what that invokes for you. I'd love for you to share a little bit more with the audience about that uh, from your perspective. Yes, yes. So one, one experience that, that I've had and when I look at the tradition of, of other artists, Black artists that have come before me, such as someone like Langston Hughes who wrote about this as well, looking at nature can be really complicated for Black people um, because it's not always it's not always just looking at a tree. Oh, the tree is so beautiful. Well, you don't have to go back that far in history to see what happened with trees and Black people okay. not long ago. I mean, <laughs> we're talking less right. than 100 years ago. Um, it was like five minutes ago. I know, And right? you just keep going back and it gets more and more complicated to something that may seem as neutral as the ocean is actually filled with so much complexity and pain and suffering and loss. And I found myself as a young person who, I, I didn't grow up by, the, by, the, by like a beach, but I grew up in Georgia, which is adjacent to the Atlantic Ocean. And, and you can see, you know, travel a few hours and go to the ocean. And I grew up in the, the very few times that I did go to the ocean, looking out onto the Atlantic with the history and knowledge that I had of slave ships coming on these very shores and looking at the water wasn't peaceful for me. And it wasn't something that I just looked at and I was just able to just take in the, the vast blue and just get lost in the endless wonder of an endless sea. I, I didn't have that. I was always conflicted with, wow, it was on these very waters that my ancestors from not that long ago traveled here, not by choice, to a whole new world, a whole new life that they didn't even ask for. And for me, I feel, I still, even as I talk about it now, I still feel that in my body. I still feel that. So for me, I, not that I have all the answers, but I was like, I want to know what it means to look at the ocean or to look at a body of water and find peace and find healing amidst all of that. I can't make the history go away. I can't erase it. I wish I could, but I can't. How can I find peace amidst that? 
And a lot of it for me starts with breathing. And it starts with closing my eyes and saying, let's just start small. And that's where kind of the image of the river came in. I'm like, this is a, a smaller body of water, a stream. For my own personal history, I didn't have any negative connotations with that necessarily. So I was like, oh, I'm going to allow myself to kind of enter into that and let that be a place that I, that I think of. And from there, I ended up discovering, oh, there's actually Negro spirituals about rivers. Um, many of them in written in, in the tradition of, of maybe even speaking about like the Jordan River and things like that. I'm like, oh, there's, there's something here. There's something here even within when our, in our history of learning how to make peace in nature amidst everything that we've gone, gone through. So that's something I, I, I just, I love to write about. And I put all that right at the beginning of the book. I'm like, this might be just super niche and specific. And maybe <laughs> I was like, maybe everyone won't get it right away, but I'm going to put it here because I know how healing this was for me. And, and I hope that it helps others find that as well. And one of your projects, you talk about the people who came before us. You talk about your ancestors, your great, great grandparents and uh, some of the decisions that they made and how it influenced you as a teenager or a person who was coming into your own for your own talent. And when I heard those words, it almost stopped me in my tracks because you were you were making a reference to challenges that we may be facing. Maybe this didn't go right today or you got this feedback from this person or whatever your trivial challenge may be, the people who came before us had so much more to deal with, so much more. And so I loved how you talked about the impact of that for you. And I'd, I'd love to learn more about how you speak about that today or how that informs you even today and how you honor those folks. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, I have to quote one of my, my favorite, and I found, her via, uh, found this work via Instagram, uh, Dr. Rosa, Rosales Mesa, who said this and said, we and I'm, paraphrasing, I'm paraphrasing the words, but we rest for our ancestors who were not able to. And those words, when I read them on Instagram, just stuck with me. I'm like, <laughs> like if words could like grab hands and grab shoulders, <laughs> like, those words did that for me, like, hey, slow down, rest. And that actually um, led me to think about kind of going back to what I was saying about how I felt about the ocean. I had this thought and I was like, you know what? As, as hard as it is to face that reality, if my ancestors could see me now, mm -hmm. they wouldn't be concerned with how you know how much success and all those things they would just be probably glad to see me breathing and being able to stand on that shore and breathe free and take a deep breath um that right there would be an accomplishment that right there is an answer to a prayer that right there is something significant and that is why I want to continue to talk about the importance of breathing and slowing down and resting because it's so easy to forget that that alone is a miracle. <laughs> um, one of my favorite poets, Audre, Audre Lorde, she had a line, and I'm paraphrasing again, <laughs> but she had a line where she says, she says in the poem, um, when you like essentially when you speak you were never meant to survive like we weren't meant to be here <laughs> it's like we weren't meant to survive all of that so when you say anything at all like that is astonishing that is a miracle and for me that just takes the pressure off mm -hmm. it's like I'm over here trying to come up with a five-year plan, 10-year plan, two-year right. plan. Like, <laughs> okay, how are we going to do this? And how am I going to factor in enough vacations and all this stuff? And I'm trying to figure all that out. And it's like, or how about just to be here and to exist is a miracle all on its own. So that's something I'm telling myself <laughs> every single day, probably multiple times a day. And I just want to continue to share that because it's, I think that 
it's and and I have and I have heard from others that that is empowering, and I and I believe that it really can be. So, yeah. Taking time and space to honor those folks the way that we are, I think is super important. But you also make some references. I think you quoted Louis Armstrong uh, and his song where he talked about. Uh, what a wonderful world and yeah. babies are crying. They'll learn much yeah. more than I'll ever know. <clears throat> and you spoke about that in a way that suggests that those who are coming after us, right. And they're looking up to us for, you know, that level of, of, of help or letting them know that it can happen for them. I'm curious to know, do you ever think about the generation after this one, maybe in your family or others, when people won't remember you, right? Which is usually oh, only yeah. one or two generations, right? When they yeah. won't remember you, you know, what legacy or what things come to mind for you? Mm -hmm. Yes. The thing that comes to mind is, I feel like I've said this word a million times, paraphrase, <laughs> but I'm always just like, I want to make sure I get the quote exactly right. But um, there is a, a, a sculptor, her name was Augusta Savage, a, a Black woman sculptor. It's hard to find many of them. And she had a unique story. And this is honestly what helped me figure out how I want to think about my legacy. And she, she made this beautiful sculpture that, I mean, I feel like if I got to see it in person someday, I would just bawl my eyes out. This incredible sculpture she made, I believe, back in the 60s for the World Fair. And they, for whatever reason, she couldn't afford some kind of like thing to have the statue removed after she had been asked to have her statue featured. And they destroyed it. They destroyed her, her I mean, what I would think is one, one of the best sculptures I've ever seen. I mean, it was astonishingly beautiful. And one of the things that she said, and I get, I get emotional even just thinking about her words, is that she said that my work doesn't live on in what I physically made, but it lives on through my students. It lives on in my students' work. And when I think about who Augusta Savage may have taught, like I've seen like, I haven't been able to find very much, but I've seen like just like little clips of her like working with students, teaching, teaching like in the 60s, like teaching black kids how to sculpt. And that's just unheard of. Like it's, it's barely heard of today. And for back then, I was like, what she was doing is huge. And when I think about those students and their kids or their, their students and how there are seeds of her work, even after some of her best work was destroyed, there are seeds of her work that are out there in the world. I'm like, that's what I want to be a part of. If in some small way, I can encourage some 14 year old black autistic kid who's out there feeling the weight of the world. And they're like, I saw this one random person on YouTube making some iPad art and I want to try it. I say this and I mean it. I'm like, I hope that if any little thing I said inspires them, like they don't even have to give me credit. Like I don't even care. Like take it and go and run with it. And that that's another one of those things that like, I don't know. For me, it takes the pressure off. I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't need to build some like big, big defined legacy in, in terms of like me needing to know exactly how it's going to play out. It's like, I'm going to be present to the work that I know how to do and whoever it ends up inspiring, however it ends up inspiring them. It's, I'm just glad to be a part of that, that stream, that flow. So, yeah. Thank you for entertaining that. I think that's a very deep question that a lot of times people don't think about, right? We just don't think about yeah. what's it going to be like, like two generations after I'm gone, right? So really <laughs> yes, appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, I actually did like a very informal poll one time on <laughs> on social media. I was like, do you think about like your legacy? And it was interesting. A lot of, it was like half and half. Like people, oh. some people are just like, don't think about it at all. And the other half were like, oh my gosh, I think about it all the time. So yeah, I think it's a, <laughs> I think it's a very interesting <laughs> topic <laughs> for my little informal survey. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you talk about peace. We've had this theme now of breathing, inhale, exhale, which we all know it. It's so simple, but we already talked about the fact that it's the one thing we stop doing or you ever done yoga. Lord knows if you don't breathe right, you will be dizzy for days trying to figure that out. <laughs> I'm curious to know, you know, what things do you rely on to find peace every day besides breathing in and breathing out? Mm, yes, moving my hands. Um, hmm. 
I find that that is, um, and, and credit to the therapist who told me to do that <laughs> a few years ago, like Morgan, you're really in your head. You need to get in your body. Um, but I'm not like, like you said about yoga, like I'm not like, I, I'm not a pro at that. You know, I, <laughs> I try, I love it, but it's not something that I, I naturally find very easy, but I find that just moving my hands, even um, something as simple as, I mean, this could be me being autistic is a part of it as well. Like I have like these little, like it's called an infinity cube and it's just moving these little things. And what I'm finding is that the more complicated my life gets, the more simple the practices need to be. So it's like the more I feel like it's kind of complex in my life. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a million things to do this week. Like I'm navigating this into that, into this, into that. Then it's like, okay, well, maybe the peaceful things that I need to do this week is to literally just go stand outside and let my feet touch the grass. Maybe that's what it is. It doesn't have to be, you know, a trip to a beautiful park somewhere far away. My feet just need to touch the grass today. My face just needs to feel the fresh air. My skin needs to see the sun. Mm -hmm. My hand needs to move across something that's not on a screen. So I am actually very serious about trying to find as many simple practices as possible because those little things end up adding up to make it easier to kind of take those more deep breaths and, and find more peace in daily life. Absolutely. I mean, the renewal from just being in nature, like you mentioned earlier, somebody told me about a term recently called forest bathing. I was like, what is forest oh, bathing? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Largely <laughs> just walking with shoes off. Just sounds cool. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> sounds great. Uh, yes. So uh, very interesting. Yeah. Super, super interesting. So I'm curious to know, like, do we ever find peace and keep it? Or, you know, is it a one and done thing? Or how do you find that? Or how have you found that? Yeah. So one thing that I have have just in my in my own studying and just reading, you know, other people who've written about peace and finding peace in their daily life is that it really is something that, while it may always be there and available to us, it doesn't mean that we have to feel peaceful all the time, every every inst instance of our lives. So it's like you know maybe if if you're about to go into surgery and you're feeling anxious about it, there's no shame in that feeling. It's like you have every right to feel anxious in this moment. That only makes sense. And, you know, there's so much study, studies that have just been done in psychology, even just like the importance of us feeling our emotions. And I think that sometimes there can be emotions that we have, such as anxiousness or, you know, some kind of fearful emotion that may keep us from experiencing peace. But that doesn't mean that we're doing something wrong <laughs> because it, because peace doesn't feel like it's right there for us. So I think that that is one of the gifts of just, you know, all the people who have, who have researchers who have been studying about how we as humans interact with our own emotions and feelings and, and different anxious experiences, even just to say like, hey, it's, it is something that we may not feel in that peaceful state all the time, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's not available to us and we can't continue to practice to have more peace in our life. Absolutely. And I'm sure you would agree with all the global events that have gone on, especially in the black community uh, over the last couple of years, it's, all, it's an anxious time, right? Mm -hmm. um, everybody is highly stressed. Yeah. I'm curious to know between the breathing, inhaling, exhaling, using your hands, how do you, when there is some major event that is just taken over the airways, right? You can't get mm -hmm. away from it. Uh, how do you find peace in those moments? Is there anything extra that you do? Do you layer on any uh, super strength piece tools yeah. <laughs> to uh, get through those steps. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. I would say more sleep and even sleep. just some. Um, and one thing I found too about sleep that's really interesting is that it's, it's, I can't, that's something I have to practice too. You know, mm. like I, I watch my two year old and I'm just like, you can just fall asleep anywhere. It's amazing. Like <laughs> with anything. And I'm just like, the older, I feel like the older we get, the harder that is, you know, it's like, it's harder to just be like, okay, all this is overwhelming. I'm just going to go to sleep. Like, <laughs> 
okay and like that's not that's something you have to to practice so that's something that i've just been giving myself i, I feel like over these past few years i have spent more time just like laying on the couch doing nothing um than ever before yeah. <laughs> especially as an adult i mean i have like like memories that I can recount right now. Like, oh yeah, like a year ago, I was just like, well, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm just going to sit here. I'm just going to sit here. Or I'm just going to lay in the bed and just close the blinds and just sit here for a minute. So I've been trying to, I've been trying to learn how to do that. Like, this is sort of like a, a random thing, but I kind of like looking back and I don't know if this is regional or whatever, but I grew up in a, in, in this part of like just just outside of Atlanta to where I always like to say it's like kind of right where like the rule and the and the kind of city kind of meet because it because the, the city I lived in was like the last bus stop so there was definitely some like country country vibes where I grew up and I used to always observe a lot of the older people in the community that they would just sit on the porch just sit and I remember as a teenager I'm like why are y'all just sitting like why? Like, I don't get it. And I'm like, I think I get it now. I think there is something to just like, yes, the world is going by and there's all this stuff going on, but we got to learn how to just sit and, and rock on the porch. So that's my way it. of doing that. <laughs> I don't know why, but I got an image in my head of Miss Jenkins from like color, uh, in living color. I don't know if you remember that, but it was a super funny sitcom back in the day. Yeah. But it was like just Miss Jenkins on the porch and she would tell everybody's business. It was hilarious. I forgot about um, that. <laughs> it's just hilarious. Sorry, it's that just came thing. into my mind. No, it's a whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I know that in one of your projects, you talk about interruptions and invitations and missing one or not understanding how one could influence the other. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, yes. So as you know, as somebody who is passionate about finding more rhythms of peace in daily life. Just, you know, as we've already said, it's hard to find and it's hard to maintain, especially when there's so many. It's like you have like the the kind of noise that happens from the world in general and everything that's going on, but you also have just, you know, maybe a, a, a roommate who is insistent on blasting music all the time. Or maybe you have, you know, you live by a busy street and there's a lot of noise going on. And this is something that because I am autistic and within my autism diagnosis, I also received a sensory processing disorder. I'm hyper aware of how quickly and easily it is to get interrupted in daily life just by the sounds and the amount of sensory input that's happening on a daily basis. So one thing that, I mean, just to survive and, and be my best self is what I have had to learn how to do is see, okay, how can I look at these interruptions as invitations? And a lot of times that invitation is to simply breathe deep. When I'm hearing these loud sounds, when I'm having some someone um, come, I, I literally had one time I was, I was like doing a video chat like this and, um, I was like, can I pause? You know, someone at my door and I went and got the door and it was someone coming to pick something up, totally forgot they were coming. And it was just like a whole thing. And I was like, oh, I'm so frustrated. Like, oh, it's an interruption, but it's like, or maybe something breaking off of the script that I had isn't always just, oh, it's just an interruption. I was also able to just be present to that person in that moment and give them what they needed. And mm -hmm. it was a small thing, but I'm like that, that can, if I can practice that with the small things, that's going to help me with the bigger interruptions that come with life. And I can learn to see those as invitations to slow down and rest and recoup and breathe deep. Fantastic. We just have two more questions before we go to the Q and A. So with the book coming out on the 15th, uh, I'm curious to know, you know, what do you hope most for the folks who read the book? What outcomes do you hope for them? Yes, I hope that people walk away with some ideas on how they can practice inviting peace into their daily life. I was very intentional with most most uh, the chapters in the book. There are practices at the end of each chapter that you can take with you. And I was very intentional with those practices that I was like, I want to make these for people who 
have busy schedules or just like, I don't have time to like go add a whole bunch of things. I want to give people just enough that says, I feel empowered to incorporate more peace practices in my daily life. So that's what I hope people take from this book. And of course, just because I'm the kind of person who starts at the end of the book and then reads the other way. Uh, <laughs> I, just give us, <laughs> I just, I'm like, is this worth my time? Okay, yeah, it is. All right, let me go. Um, <laughs> yes. Sorry. Uh, so can you give us an example of maybe what one, of, one or two of those practices are? Yes, yes. One of my, I feel like this is one of the most simple ones. It's one of my favorites. It is to light a candle while mm -hmm. you're working on something. Because we light, lighting, artificial light has an impact on us. And I get into that in the book about how artificial light has kind of made us, our, it makes our days much longer than mm -hmm. there, there sometimes needs to be because we no longer have those natural rhythms of the sun fading from the sky and now the day's over. We don't have that anymore. And I share some interesting research that's been done on that. So what I've realized, and I do this all the time, is I'll light a candle when I'm working on something because what candles remind us of is that we weren't meant to burn bright all the time. That candle can yeah. only go so long before it needs a break because <laughs> that wax starts getting all over the place and you can't just leave a, you can't leave a candle on as near as long as you can leave a light bulb on. So even just that visual reminder, when that candle is going out, it's time for me to back away, it's time for me to take a break, is something that I've noticed is very surprisingly, very insightful. So that's that's one of them that I have in the book that I'm really excited about people seeing. I hope it's a tea light candle and not one of those big jumble ones oh, yeah. that like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little one, it's a little one, yeah, because you can, not one of those like five wick candles that. <laughs> You're like, what's my break? Go out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so give us an idea for those of us who'd like to read your book, who'd like to become more familiar with your work. Maybe some folks haven't heard of you before and they just want to kind of go on this journey. What do you recommend? Because I know you've got a lot of projects and a lot of ways to interact. Uh, so what would be a good way for people to get started with your content and your message? Yeah, so I have a, I feel like this is this is one of my, my, my big projects right now that I'm super excited about, is I have a very, very short podcast. It's a daily podcast. It's like five minutes. And it is intentionally five minutes because I want it to be something that you can just turn to to help you just slow down. Even if you're just listening to it passively while you're getting ready for work, just something to say, okay, I'm free to just take my time here. So I love to try to create little things like that in places that you may already be listening to podcasts or whatever, just these short little breaks. And I also try to make my social media feeds that way as well. So I'm on Instagram and all those good places. And I have these little short podcasts where you can find these moments and invitations to practice peace. And of course, if you want something longer, the book, the books where I kind of, you know, go deeper into all of that. But those are just some of the, the places you can find me. Well, I've gotten a chance to listen to your podcast, which I was like, wow, her voice is like velvet, the texture oh. of velvet. It was just like, so amazing. And it was literally something that made me, several of the things you said just made me stop in my tracks. And what I appreciated the most is at the very end when you give that one thing to think about, that one thing to do. Yes. I thought that was super, super powerful. So I encourage everyone to uh, go to her website and, uh, listen to, or at least get linked to the yes. podcast, which are everywhere. Yes. All right. You. We are going to go to the questions. We've got some questions all lined awesome. up here. Um, and uh, I am ready for the first one. All right. This one comes from Shweta. Shweta, thank you for being with us. She asks, can you talk more about bringing peace into moments of fear or chaos? Amen on that one. Uh, mm -hmm. Love to know more about that. Yes. Leaning into your strengths. And that's something that I talk about in this book. For me, a lot of times that looks like creativity. But again, I talk about this in this book. I give examples of engineers, people who are in different, leader, different forms of leadership. And how can you use your skills to bring peace in daily life? And it could be your profession or it could just be something you do as a hobby. And one thing that I, I love is that we all have something like some of us are really good at cooking or baking and even just baking things for people in your community who are overlooked 
is a way of bringing peace in the world. Yes, it's small. No, it doesn't change everything, but it does help us practice. And it is something that we all commit to bringing our skills into the fold to, to bring about peace, not only for ourselves, but for other people, we really can make a difference. Excellent. Yeah, I think it's so important to know what impact we can have and the peace we can spread and how that mm. calms us down, right? Yeah. Gives us oh, perspective. Yeah. So thanks for yes. sharing that. Yeah, I love that. All right, we'll sure. take the next question. All right, this one comes from Sung Anya. I may be saying that incorrectly and I apologize, but thank you for being with us. She says, hi, Morgan. Thank you for joining us today. I really love your poetry and art. Uh, which of your poems <laughs> is one of your favorites? Oh, thank you for asking this. I would say it's probably the first one that I ever really kind of shared. And I won't say the whole thing, but one line that it starts with, when you start to feel like things should have been better this year, remember the mountains and valleys that brought you here. And I honestly feel like <laughs> every I, I shared that for the first time in 2016. And I really do feel like since then, a lot of what I've created is still built on that idea. So yeah, I would say that's one of my favorites. Do you have like a gratitude practice or something that you do to, I know you talk about the bibliography and kind of having that. Is there anything that you do to kind of keep that type of thing top of mind? Yes, I have a, I have a very, um, I have a system in my notes app on my phone and I pin list at the top. Cause I realized I was like, why are all the notes, why are all my notes to-do lists? I'm like, there's other lists that need to be in my phone other than stuff I need to do. <laughs> so I was like, what about the stuff I've already done? So I actually have a gratitude list on my phone and I even put some artwork at the top of it. So it looks inviting to click on and I click on it almost every day. And I'm like, I Hey, remember you. that time, like five years ago that happened and you were really proud of it. Or remember that thing last week? And I had just this long ongoing list. There's hundreds of things on there now. And I started that back in November and it has been, it has been very helpful for me to have that on my phone and I turn to it often. That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that with us. It's a good system. All right, we're ready for the next question. All right, this one comes from Blake Lewis. She says, thank you so much for sharing, Morgan. I admire your vulnerability and honesty. How did you gain the confidence to share your stories and your art? Great question, Blake. Yes, thank you, Blake. I was just thinking about this this morning. I was, <laughs> and I was like, I think I've found a way to kind of explain it in like a little bit of words. I'm a huge believer in slow, slow vulnerability. I think hmm. that a lot of times, like, there is this pressure for when you share something vulnerable about your story or your life that you got to like get the whole thing into an essay and get it out there for all to see. And I was just like, you know what? I am like, just now, like I'm 32 years old and I am just now starting to talk about some of the childhood bullies that I, some of the stuff I dealt with being bullied as a kid. I'm like, I, 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 I've been on the internet sharing for over a decade now. And I'm just like, I'm just now feeling comfortable with sharing that, even just saying that I was bullied as a child. It still is like, whoa, that's, that's a lot. So I think that it's, it's having grace for ourselves to, to pace ourselves through sharing. Sometimes that's not the message we get online when we see people sharing in big ways. And hey, sometimes it comes out that way. It's great. But for me, it's been very, 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 very slow. And I try to, I try to give myself grace to kind of slowly, slowly share more and more. Yeah. Do you think also it has something to do with the fact that you don't require people's acceptance as you mature mm -hmm. a little bit and you start to you know, yeah. have the things that come along with maturing, you start yeah. to value your own opinion more than the acceptance oh, yeah. of others. Absolutely. I mean, when I think about like the past 10 years of my life, 22 year old Morgan was a lot more freaked out by somebody unfollowing me. Or I literally remember someone from college unfriending me and sending them a message saying, hey, did I do something wrong? <laughs> Why did you unfriend me? And just over this past 10 years, I'm like, yeah, that's not something that consumes my thinking the way that it used to. So I'm like, yeah, that's definitely, you're right. That's definitely something I think we learn and grow more with time for sure. Plus one. All right, we're ready for the next question. Erica asks, 
or says, you are such an inspiration to me and many others. I'd love to know who inspires you and who do you admire? Oh, I love this question. Thank you for asking. I'm inspired by so many people. Um, but I would say one of my biggest inspirations is probably my grandfather. My grandfather had to drop out of school in fourth grade to help take care of his family. And he is the, he is the reason that I started playing musical instruments because he was just picking up instruments from garage sales and teaching himself how to play in his 60s and 70s. And he invited me into that practice in his own life as he was learning. And when I just think about everything that he went through in his life, all of the racism that he encountered and everything that happened after having to drop out of school in fourth grade, I'm just like, the fact that he could still find ways to not only find joy and curiosity in his life, but to also invite his grandkids into it too, was just like, I'm like, yeah, that's what I look up to. And, and, I, and I try to remind him of that as well, because it's, I, I, that really does inspire me. And I'm also just inspired by like a ton of artists who have just like, like one of my, I'll just give you a name, Alma Thomas, black abstract painter. And I just, I just want her name to be known. Cause I'm just like, it's, it's, I have a book of, of women in abstract art and she's the only black person in the book. And I'm just like, oh, Alma, <laughs> I'm here because of you. So yeah, those are just some of, some of my examples. Fantastic. Okay, we'll take the next question. This one comes from Rainier. She says, your words have bought me so much peace. Thank you. I'm curious, what are you reading right now? Yeah, so we are having this conversation a day after Langston Hughes' birthday and I have his anthology. And I'm like you, I like to flip through books, but I actually was like, I'm going to start this, this like this thick. I'm like, I'm going to start from page one. I have never done that with this book. I'm, like, I'm just going to try it because I'm like, this poet has meant so much in my life. I, I want to do even deeper dive. So yeah, that's actually what's it's on this table right here. That's my, my go-to right now. So Langston and Hughes Anthology. <laughs> Fantastic. And I think we have two more questions left. We'll take the next question. Awesome. All right, and Gabrielle has a question. She says, how has your faith impacted or given purpose to your work? Great question, Gabrielle. Yeah, so I grew up in an African-American Christian tradition and it took a long time for me to recognize the, the specificities even of, of that, that experience and how that has impacted the way I, I, I approach faith and I talk about faith. And it's, it's impacted my life a lot. Like I've, I've even realized recently, I, I'm really into writing like these short poetic phrases. And I just realized like the past few months, I was like, I think that part is inspired by the hooks that I would hear growing up in gospel music. I was like, there's like these short phrases and, and they would get repeated in sermons and they would get shared beyond the song. And I was like, I see that in my work. I was like, that's impacted my work. And, and I think for me, that is just, I get so excited about that because I'm like, wow, there have been times where as, as a person of faith over the past few years, where it's just been like, whoa, that's, you know, even I'm like, I don't want to be someone who is saying like, oh, I am a person of faith. So therefore I can't talk about race. Like, I don't, I don't believe in that. And so it's been very healing for me to, to discover, oh, wow, there's a rich history here that I feel like I'm, I'm still learning more and more about. And it definitely impacts my work today. So, yeah. And you're honoring that rich history, right? In your own way, mm -hmm. uh, in the way that's most probably authentic for you. So kudos for that. You know, I, I have to say, you know, growing up with having that faith in your background, man, sometimes it used to take all day Sunday, though. You ever wonder, like, oh, why is it taking all day on Sunday? Like, all day. All day. <laughs> stuff to do. <laughs> That's why those books are still all on your All day. Sunday. All day Sunday. All right. All day. <laughs> we'll, go Not to the last, <laughs> we'll go to the last question. All right. This one comes from Morgan. Thanks, Morgan, for being with us. She says, thank you so much for joining, Morgan, Morgan Squared. Uh, your yes. art and writings continue to give me hope, clarity, and peace. You radiate magic. I agree on that. Totally. Magic is exactly what I thought as well. 
So what's your favorite grounding practice? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Morgan, another Morgan. Thank you so much for this question. I would say it is taking my shoes off and going and standing in the grass outside. I'm very fortunate that I live in Arizona, so I can pretty much do that year round and, you know, not be freezing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I do that on a regular basis. And it's something that I'm, I'm very grateful for because, you know, I do have a toddler who like I can take outside and I can just engage in that very quickly. Um, so yeah, I would say that that's my favorite. Fantastic. And we've got one more question that slid in here. I'll take that one, Tim. And this comes from Goldie. Hey, Goldie. She says, hi, Morgan and Lila. Thank you for having this talk. I recently found your Instagram page and I'm a huge fan. Your words are so inspiring and reassuring in times of uncertainty. What a wonderful you, Goldie. <laughs> phrase. Any thoughts on that? Anything that you want to oh, share? Oh, that, that means a lot to hear. And, you know, any I, to hear that it's, it's reassuring in times of uncertainty. It's, that means a lot because it, it's, it's, um, it's like sometimes there is a pressure with like being someone who shares publicly of like, oh my gosh, are people coming to me for answers or, you know, all the solutions. And it's like, I'm a human, like, and I'm also like in my early thirties, like I'm still learning. Um, so it's, it's just, it's comforting and encouraging to hear of like, oh, wow. If, if you're seeing my words as something assuring or, or comforting in these uncertain times. I'm like, yeah, that's something I'm, I'm seeking in my own life. So I'm, I'm honored to share that with you. So thank you. So Morgan, to summarize, you talked about how growing up and finding your space and really digging into peace and creating all of these outlets through your art, through podcasts, through your poetry, through Instagram, now through the books that that you have with the one that's coming out on February 15th as well. Just all these different opportunities for people to engage with your message, but also for you to share a bit about yourself, share a little bit about your passion, share a little bit of your magic uh, with us. And I just want to, as we wrap up here, share that all of that is so incredibly encouraging. There's so many of us who, uh, as we're going through our day, I mean, the messages that you're sharing and the mediums that you're doing it have a huge, huge impact. So your idea about leaving a legacy where somebody learns one or two things from you and they go and build on that, I think is just fantastic. So we're about to wrap up. Are there any closing comments that you'd like to share with your audience? Oh, um, thank you. Thank you so much for even just reflecting my own <laughs> my own story and work back to me. It was just very encouraging. Um, I think the only thing that I would add is just, you know, I talk a lot about practicing peace and inviting people to do it. And I always want to say, like, it's not just for the artists. <laughs> so it's like, if you're like, I'm not creative or I'm just not doing that right now. It's like, it's being able to find those rhythms to breathe in daily life is something that we can all do in our own unique way. And I, I hope that everyone can continue to explore what that looks like in their daily life. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you for being with us. Thank you all for listening. And uh, I bid you a good rest of the day. Yes, thank you.